Bioshock 5, Burial at Sea. Chapter 1 The bathysphere docked with a hiss, its metal hatch sliding open to reveal the grand promenade of rapture. Booker DeWitt stepped out into the deserted corridor, the click of his shoes echoing off the Art Deco walls. Ten years had passed since the fall of Columbia, and now here he was, starring over in another impossible city under the sea. He adjusted his tie as he walked, glancing around warily. Rapture was a shadow of its former self, a leaky ceilings, rubble strewn about, whole sections cordoned off after violent uprisings. But it was still home, the only place left for people like him looking to disappear. Finding his new office in the towering Atlas Manta building was easy enough. He unlocked the frosted glass door with his name stenciled on it and flicked on the lights. It wasn't much yet, just a desk and a few filing cabinets, but he could build this place up again. Elizabeth had seemed to giving him a new beginning here, away from all the pain that came before. His first client didn't take long to arrive. A sharp rap at the doorframe made him turn from organizing his desk. A young woman stood in the entrance, blue eyes bright. Hello, miss, what can I do for you? Booker asked. She stepped inside, clasping a worn leather satchel. You must be the new detective in town, DeWitt, is it? At his nod, she continued. My name is Elizabeth. I need help finding someone. A little girl named Sally. Booker blinked in surprise. This was not the Elizabeth he remembered. She seemed younger, less hardened by everything they had endured together. But those eyes, he knew them anywhere. What new game was she playing now? Chapter 2 Why don't you start from the beginning, Booker said, gesturing Elizabeth to sit across from his desk. She settled into the chair, worry creasing her brow. Sally is my ward. She went missing over a week ago, just vanished without a trace. I've tried all I can think of to find her, but no luck. Booker flipped open a notepad, pen poised. And where did you last see her? At our apartment in Mercury Suites. She was playing in her room when I stepped out for groceries. When I came back, she was gone. No signs of forced entry or a struggle? Elizabeth shook her head. Nothing obvious, but Sally wouldn't just wander off on her own. Booker jotted a few notes. A missing child case would certainly get the agency off the ground. Does Sally have any family or friends she might have gone to visit? No, it's just been us since I took her in a year ago. Her parents aren't in the picture. Elizabeth's expression turned pensive for a moment before she looked back at him. I can pay your fees, whatever your daily rate is. I just want to find Sally. Money hadn't even crossed Booker's mind. If this was Elizabeth, some version of her anyway, he had to take the case. Of course, consider me on it, he said. I'll start canvassing around town for leads and keep you updated. Elizabeth's shoulders sagged a little in relief. Thank you, I know she's out there somewhere scared, probably hungry. Her voice hitched. Booker felt an echo of familiar need to comfort her well up, even if this wasn't quite the same girl he knew. Hey, I'll find her, that's a promise. Elizabeth managed a small smile in return. I hope so, good luck, Mr. DeWitt. She left the office and Booker leaned back in his chair. He had a missing kid to find, and barely a clue where to start. But he knew one man who made it his business to know everyone's comings and goings in rapture, Sander Cohen. Time for an old artist's perspective. Chapter 3 The door clanged open to Cohen's run-down gallery, the one remaining spot in rapture where hints of culture still lingered. 
Booker stepped inside, wrinkling his nose at the moldy scent. He never understood Cohen's abstract art even back in his security guard days. Give him something concrete over the twisted figures lining the walls any day. Mr. DeWitt, what an unexpected surprise. Cohen emerged from a side room, face painted stark white like some Grimaldi clown. Come to appreciate the finer things in life. Here on business, I'm afraid. Booker flashed a photograph of Sally he borrowed from Elizabeth. A girl went missing in Mercury Suites, know anything. Cohen glanced at the picture with a theatrical sigh. Ah yes, the way Sally, word does travel of such sad affairs. When the artist didn't elaborate, Booker pressed, well, did that word happen to carry where she might have disappeared to? Your guess is as good as mine. Cohen wandered over to a sculpture that looked vaguely like a man contorted in anguish. The whispers suggest Anya Suchong's clinic, but I try not to involve myself in ugly matters. Suchong. The name sounded familiar for some reason Booker couldn't place. But if it meant a solid lead... Much appreciated. He pocketed the photograph and turned to leave. Send the girl Elizabeth my regards when you find her, Cohen called after him. Booker froze, slowly looking back over his shoulder. Come again? Elizabeth. Cohen arched a painted eyebrow. Such a lovely child, even with her limitations. Do tell her I hope she's keeping up with her finger exercises. Booker stared. Elizabeth had never mentioned meeting Cohen before. Had never set foot in rapture at all until now, as far as he knew. A deep sense of wrongness settled in his gut. Right, I'll let her know, he said carefully before pushing his way out onto the promenade. This wasn't adding up. Not the Elizabeth he knew, but she sure as hell seemed to know him. What reality had she come from? And what did Suchong's clinic have to do with Sally's disappearance? For her sake, he had to risk finding out. Chapter 4 Suchong's clinic sat tucked away in a decaying corner of Olympus Heights. As Booker approached down the garbage-strewn street, he noted the building's fortified walls and barred windows. Nothing abnormal for rapture, but it still raised his hackles. What were they trying to keep out, or in? He circled the block, scoping for a back way in, and found an exterior vent grate popping loose from its screws. The opening would be a tight squeeze, but doable. Booker pried off the cover and shimmed inside, grumbling as his broad shoulders scraped against the walls. The things he did to solve cases. The vent deposited him in a storage room littered with large canisters marked plasmid test subjects, Booker frowned. Adam harvesting, just the thing to avoid these days. He crept to the door and peeked out into a dingy hallway. A nearby room buzzed with conversation. Trials show the new little sister models can absorb a double the Adam doctor. Excellent. Prepare more for prototype implantation. A pause. And have subject two prepped again. I wish to observe her indicated memory regression when the big daddy bonding process repeats. Booker's jaw tightened. He didn't know what any of that meant, but it sounded sinister as hell. Records from Byron G. Suchong's clinic trials weren't on file for being humane. He slipped down the hall towards a set of double doors with authorized personnel only stenciled across them and pressed his ear to the crack. Machinery hummed and gurgled on the other side. Bracing himself, Booker eased the door open inch by inch, just enough to peer through. His eyes widened. 
Little girls in tattered dresses lay unconscious and hooked up to IVs as technicians in white coats moved between them. Nearby, a lumbering figure in an old-fashioned diving suit paced in front of a sobbing dark-haired girl, strapped to an operating chair. Where? Where is Mr. B? The girl choked out. Booker eased the door shut again, bile rising in his throat. What kind of twisted experiments was such on running here? No wonder Elizabeth wanted her ward out of this place. He had to find Sally and fast, before she wound up yet another of Suchong's test subjects. Answers could come later. Chapter 5 Hitting past the operating rooms turned out to be the easy part. Booker just had to poke around enough unmarked corridors until he located a creaky utility stairwell leading up through the building. Seemed none of Suchong's staff cared to take the long hike upward. Near as Booker could guess, Sally was being kept somewhere on the third floor. That's where things got trickier. More locked doors and runes clearly still in use. He pressed on cautiously, picking a simple lock here and there, peeking inside each one. Most held medical equipment or supplies, nothing out of the ordinary. Then he reached room 358, and the soft whimpers from within. Booker knelt by the door, inspecting the lock. Sally, you in there, kid? He asked gently. The whimpering hitched. Mr. Bubbles, a small voice ventured. Booker frowned at the odd name. No, just me. A friend. Can I get you all right? He went to work on the lock with his pocket knife, the tumblers clicking after some wiggling. As the door creaked open, he pressed a finger to his lips. Gotta be real quiet now. The dark-haired girl from before sat huddled in the corner, wrists and ankles bound in restraints. Sally. She watched him with big, fearful eyes. Let's get you home, Booker murmured, scooping her up. She clung to his coat, trembling. Heavy footfalls echoed down the hall then, accompanied by shouting. Booker straightened, glancing around the room. No time to double back. His gaze landed on the ventilation grate near the ceiling. Hold on tight. He stepped up onto the metal frame bed and stretched to pop the grate free, hoisting Sally through first before pulling himself up. Not a moment too soon either as the door crashed open, Suchong himself entering flanked by men in white. Sally whimpered at the sight of them. Booker shushed her gently as he fixed the grate back into place. Check the ward, Suchong snapped. The asset could not have gone far. Asset. Booker bristled at how casually Suchong dehumanized these girls. He shuffled further into the vent, keeping a protective hold on Sally. They just had to keep moving. Get back to Elizabeth. Sort this whole mess out later. For now, it was enough that Sally was safe. Chapter 6 The vent took some twisting and turning before Booker located a way out on the first floor. He paused at the grate, listening. No sounds of pursuit so far. I'm going to lower you down first, all right, then it's just a quick walk outside, he said. Sally nodded, scrubbing at her red-rimmed eyes with a sniffle. Booker eased the grate off and set the girl down before dropping out of the vent himself. So far, so good. They just had to play it cool and slip right out the front door. He ushered Sally down the hall only to stop short. Two men blocked the exit, faces obscured by diver helmets. Well, ain't you two a sight, came a voice behind them. Booker turned to see a lanky man in a sweater vest approach, twirling a golf club. He smiled, but it didn't reach his cold eyes. Elizabeth stood at his side, 
refusal in the tight line of her mouth, even as she avoided Booker's gaze. Sorry about the confusion, the lanky man continued. You got my friend Elizabeth worried sick, kid, why don't you wait outside while the grown-ups talk for a spell? Sally hesitated until Elizabeth gave her a gentle nudge forward. The girl cast a last look between them before scurrying out. The lanky man watched her go, tapping his golf club against one palm. Ryan promised a golf course somewhere in this dump. A man needs a hobby, right? His eyes flicked to Booker. The name's Atlas. The name triggered Booker's memory. Atlas, the man who started Rapture's uprising. Which meant, wherever this version of Elizabeth came from, she was playing a dangerous game. Booker crossed his arms. I've heard of you, can't say I've heard much good. Atlas chuckled without humor. We've all done what we must to get by in this place. He glanced at Elizabeth. Though your lady friend here puzzles me, gets a bee in her bonnet over finding this girl, then won't even say where she sprang from. Elizabeth's expression remained tight-lipped. Booker got the sense this uneasy alliance was her idea, though why that meant working with the likes of Atlas. Point is you lost my war, I hired Mr. DeWitt to recover her. Elizabeth finally looked at Booker, something unspoken passing between them. Thank you, truly. Atlas waved the pleasantries aside. I scratch your back, you scratch mine, we can help each other, you and I. His gaze pinned on Booker. But friends close, enemies closer, watch your step. It wasn't a request. Booker tensed, ready to fight his way out if needed. But Elizabeth's eyes pleaded patience. With a slow exhale, he relented for now. Sally was safe. That was enough. They could figure the rest out later. Chapter 7 Booker wasn't foolish enough to lead Atlas back to his office. Better to lose any tales first. He led Elizabeth and Sally through a meandering path around Point Prometheus, doubling back until he was reasonably sure no one followed them anymore. Only then did he usher them into the Atlas Manta building and up to his agency floor. Inside his office, Booker flipped the sign to closed and locked the door. We should be safe to talk here, he said, checking the windows. Curtains drawn, door secure. He turned back to Elizabeth. I think you owe me an explanation. She worried a loose thread on her blouse, not meeting his eyes. It's complicated. I'm not even sure where to begin. Booker leaned against his desk, arms folded. How about with where you really came from? Elizabeth sighed, sinking into a chair. Sally perched on her lap, still subdued. You're right. I'm not the Elizabeth you knew, she admitted. I'm from another reality, one where I failed to save Sally from Suchong's experiments. Her expression grew pained. She was turned into a little sister. By the time I got to her, it was too late. Booker scowled. Other realities, other versions of Elizabeth. Would he ever understand it? So coming here was for a second chance. Yes, when I found a version of Rapture where Sally still lived with her parents, I had to try and change things. Her arms tightened around the girl. I can give her a better life here. It made sense in its own tragic way, though one piece still puzzled him. And Atlas, where does he fit in? Before Elizabeth could respond, a muffled boon sounded from the hallway outside. Booker tensed. Had they been followed after all? He crossed to the door, peering out the eye hole just as white smoke billowed under the frame. Knockout gas. He reeled back, clapping a hand over his mouth. Get down. 
but it was too late. The room spun as the cloying fumes sucked the air from his lungs. Through the haze, he saw Elizabeth slump forward, Sally spilling from her grip. Then his legs gave out and everything went dark. Chapter 8 Consciousness returned in phases, a throbbing headache, the cold press of concrete against his cheek. Booker groaned and rolled onto his back, prying his gummy eyes open. An exposed bulb swung overhead, the only light in, wherever the hell he was. It looked like some kind of warehouse basement, rusted pipes running along the walls. He sat up slowly, bracing against a wave of dizziness. It must have hauled him here after gassing the office. But where was... Elizabeth? Booker called hoarsely. His voice echoed back unanswered. She and Sally were gone. He staggered to his feet, ribs aching in protest. Atlas's work, no doubt. Question was if the girls were captives too or somehow in on this betrayal. Either way, he had to find them fast. Footsteps sounded outside the room then, voices growing louder. No time to concoct a clever escape plan. Booker eyed the door, then a nearby air vent. He pried off the grate and hauled himself up, just as the door opened. Two of Atlas's men strode in, pausing at the side of the empty room. Booker held his breath, praying they wouldn't look up. Luck stayed on his side for once. With a shrug, the two thugs headed back out, locking the door behind them. Booker crawled through the claustrophobic vent, taking random turns in hopes of finding a way out. These old maintenance routes all connected somewhere. He just had to keep moving. Sure enough, after one last squeeze past cobwebbed piping, he reached another vent cover. Bracing his back against the opposite wall, Booker kicked it free and slid out into open air. The vent had led him outside, dumping him out on a rusty fire escape landing. He took a second to get his bearings. Looked like he was on the backside of a warehouse near the piers. Not far from his office, at least. First order of business was getting there, armed and ready for whatever came next. Scrambling down the slick metal stairs, Booker slipped through back alleys until the Atlas Manta building came into view. He eyed the front entrance warily. Could be more of Atlas's boys waiting inside better take the direct approach. Booker marched right up to the doors and shouldered his way in. Two men jumped to their feet from where they had been loitering in the lobby. Booker barreled past them and punched the elevator call button before they could react. Hey, pal, where do you think you're going? One grabbed his shoulder. Booker spun and decked him flat. Back off. I've got business to handle. The elevator dinged open, and he darted inside, hammering the door close button. The second thud rushed over only to get the door shut in his face. As the elevator ascended, Booker shook out his stinging knuckles. He had a pretty good idea where to start looking for answers now. Time to pay Atlas a visit. Chapter 9 Finding Atlas's hideout took calling in a few favors around town, greasing some palms, and making threats where needed. But soon enough Booker stood outside a rundown tenement building on the edge of Popper's Drop. Time for some answers. He burst through the door to find Elizabeth, and Atlas bent over a table, deep in discussion. They both looked up in surprise as Booker stormed over. We need to talk now, he bit out, glaring between them. Atlas leaned against the table casually. Son, you don't look so good. Why don't you have a seat, take a load off? Booker didn't budge. I want the truth, all of it. Elizabeth stepped forward, 
palms raised placatingly. Please, let me explain. That you sold me out to this low life. Booker cut her off harshly. That you used me to grab Sally only to turn her back over? It's not like that. Elizabeth shot back before catching herself. She took a breath. Alice promised he would hide Sally from such on. I had to take that chance. Booker studied her face, trying to read the honesty there. She had spun half-truths before, but this felt different. Atlas cleared his throat. How about we give you two a minute, Simon, kid? He ushered Sally into an adjoining room, closing the door behind them. Alone now, Elizabeth moved closer, her voice low. Sally isn't just some girl to me, Booker. She's all I have left if Suchong takes her. Pain flickered across her face. You dad protecting me once, I can't lose her too. Taken aback, Booker searched her eyes. Perhaps she had spun his story initially about being from another reality. But the torment he saw in her now was real. This was his Elizabeth, carrying the weight of everything that came before, desperate not to lose the one light left in her life. His shoulders sagged. Okay, I believe you. Elizabeth loosed a shaky breath, blinking back tears. Thank you for coming back for us. She rested a hand on his arm with a sad smile. And for a moment, despite all the strangeness between them, it felt like home. Chapter 10 They sat together on a dilapidated sofa, Elizabeth recounting all that led her to rapture. She told him of Columbia's downfall, the years spent haunted by her deeds. By the time she spoke of finding Sally orphaned and vulnerable, her voice turned heavy with emotion. I couldn't save her before, but here... Elizabeth stroked the girl's hair as she dozed in her lap. Here I can give her the childhood I never had. She just needs time. Booker studied them both. He might not fully understand this version of Elizabeth or the road that brought her here. But her devotion to that little girl was real as anything. And we make sure she gets that chance, he said gruffly. Elizabeth offered a faint smile. We will, I prom. She jerked then, spine going rigid. Her eyes rolled back as she slumped forward. Sally woke with a cry, tumbling free as Elizabeth hit the floor. Booker lunged to grab her. Elizabeth. Atlas strode back in, tucking a syringe away into his vest. Sorry for the dramatics, but the lady and I have unfinished business. Rage boiled up hot inside Booker. He laid Elizabeth down gently and rounded on Atlas, fists clenched. You son of a bitch, what did you do to her? Merely insurance. Atlas backed towards the door casually. The girl comes with me, don't try to follow. Booker stepped forward, only for two men built like brick walls to materialize from the adjoining room. They seized his arms as he struggled. Elizabeth. Sally's panicked cry was the last thing Booker heard before one thud clobbered his temple. His legs turned to jelly, head spinning. Then the floor rushed up to meet him. Everything went black. Chapter 11 Cold water splashed across Booker's face, shocking him awake with a gasp. He bolted upright, every muscle protesting. It took a few blinks to clear his swimming vision and remember what happened. Elizabeth. Sally. Gone. Jaw clenched, he pushed himself to his feet. Atlas was going to regret this. Easy now, Boyle. No need for more knocks upside the thick head of yours. 
Booker turned with a scowl to find Atlas regarding him smugly from across the room, golf club propped on one shoulder. Where are they? Booker bit out. His hands itched to wrap around Atlas's scrawny neck. Atlas examined a speck of grime under one fingernail. Oh, in due time, but I've got a job for you first. Not interested. See, I think you are. Atlas smiled without humor. Word is you're handy with that pistol of yours. Seems some of Ryan's tin soldiers have been poking around Popper's drop. Folks aren't too happy about it. Booker crossed his arms. And what's that got to do with me? Just a minor distraction. Atlas twirled his golf club idly. You ruffle some feathers on my behalf, maybe rough up some security, then we talk about the girls. Jaw tight, Booker weighed his options. None of them good. You've got one hour. At a boy. Atlas gestured to a heavy set lackey, who handed over Booker's pistol and holster. Best get to it then. Fists clenched, Booker took the gun and stormed out. He didn't intend to play errand boy for Atlas. But it bought him time to find a way to save Elizabeth and Sally on his own terms. For now, he had little choice but to play along. Chapter 12 Booker strode through the dank halls of Popper's Drop, ignoring the wary looks cast his way. He had no quarrel with these people, but Atlas would pay soon enough. He passed a grimy window looking out on Fontaine's department store. The once extravagant shop was abandoned now like so much else in Rapture. An idea struck Booker then. If Atlas had stashed Elizabeth and Sally somewhere, maybe he was arrogant enough to keep them close. That store could hold secrets. Ducking down an alley, Booker located a maintenance door and jimmed it open. Inside, he grabbed a dusty sweater off a supply shelf and pulled it on to further disguise himself. Wouldn't do to have Atlas's men reporting his presence. Ascending the stockroom stairs, Booker slipped out onto the main sales floor. Faded posters clung to the walls, while broken display cases and mannequins lay scattered about. Looked like looters had swept through at some point. He made his way through the detritus towards a grand central staircase. Peeling gold letters on the wall pointed to offices up on the top floor. Booker climbed upward, senses alert. Could be trouble waiting around any shadowy corner. But the place seemed abandoned, his footsteps the only sound. At the top, he moved down an oak-paneled hall until locating a door labeled Manager. The lock clicked open easy enough at the twist of his knife. Booker stepped inside what looked to have been Fontaine's own office once. If Atlas was using this place, maybe he had been careless enough to leave something behind. Booker rifled through the heavy wooden desk, nothing but old receipts and cigars. He turned his attention to the shelves next. That's when he noticed it. A faint rectangle of lighter paint on the wall where a hanging photo once covered. A hidden safe, perhaps. Booker pressed along the edges until he found the latch. The door creaked open to reveal a recording device inside. Worth a listen at least. He hit play, and a familiar voice filled the office. Another day, another dollar. Chapter 13 Booker's eyes widened as he snatched up the recording and pressed rewind. Frank Fontaine's voice carried unmistakable scorn and contempt even from the grave. He hit play again, listening closer. Another day, another dollar swindled from those Rockefellers. Fontaine gave a contemptuous chuckle. Oh well, Ryan thinks he's so high and mighty down here, but it takes men like me to build cities, and I'll be running this one soon enough. 
the tape clicked and whirred on through what sounded like candid recordings of Fontaine's shady business dealings and future plots. Incriminating stuff and a gold mine of leverage for whoever held these tapes now. Booker's thoughts turned back to Elizabeth's alliance with Atlas. She was too sharp not to realize the snake he was, unless she had little choice. He flipped the tape over. Fontaine's smug tone filled the office again. Just got word my ace in the hole arrived in town. A little bird told me she can be real persuasive, and once she gets me those codes from such all. Booker's blood ran cold. He knew who Fontaine meant before the name even left the creep's lips. Elizabeth can squeeze anyone for what they're worth, my kind of gal. Fontaine chuckled darkly. Sachon will play ball if he knows what's good for him. The recording clicked off, leaving Booker shaken. Using Elizabeth's talents for his own gain sounded exactly like something Atlas would try. But how had she fallen in with criminals like them in the first place? There had to be more tapes, more of the story here. Booker scoured the office until he uncovered a locked drawer beneath the desk. One quick jimmy later and a full box of recordings sat in his hands. The truth was here. He just had to keep listening. Chapter 14 The tapes led Booker down an unsettling path. In fragmented bits and pieces, Elizabeth's story came together. How she watched Sally become a little sister, consumed by guilt. How in her grief, she turned all her rage on Comstock and destroyed the possibility of his existence. But with her purpose fulfilled, Elizabeth only felt empty, haunted by her failure to save Sally. Until one day, she discovered a tear to a rapture where Sally still lived a normal life. Unable to resist, Elizabeth took the chance to reach her. Only when she arrived, Elizabeth learned Fontaine had already sunk his claws into the girl, grooming her for experiments to profit off Adam. Elizabeth blamed herself. If she had gotten here sooner, she could have prevented it all. That guilt drove her to strike a deal with Fontaine, using her powers to get leverage over Suchong. It was never about greed or malice. Just a mission to save one life when she couldn't before, no matter the cost. Booker sat back heavily, trying to process it all. He understood that pain, the need for redemption all too well. But Elizabeth was slipping down a dangerous path with Atlas. When he couldn't let her walk alone any longer. Talking the tapes away... Booker headed out with renewed purpose. The other recordings could wait. Right now, Elizabeth needed him. And he sure as hell wasn't losing her again. Chapter 15 Booker made his way through the dilapidated department store, Elizabeth's story weighing heavy on his mind. He descended a rusted metal staircase down into the building's sub-basements. If Elizabeth was here it would be in the forgotten places Atlas preferred. He passed old stock rooms, maintenance tunnels, even a cold storage locker, peeking inside each one. No signs of life yet, but he had to be getting close. The final door he tried groaned open to reveal a large utility bay. And sure enough, a familiar figure sat slumped against the far wall, Elizabeth. Booker rushed over, but pulled up short at seeing her vacant, red-rimmed eyes. Almost like she was in some kind of trance. Elizabeth, can you hear me? He grasped her shoulders gently. No response. Come on, I need you to snap out of this. He gave her a light shake. Finally, she stirred, gaze focusing on him in confusion. Booker? Her voice came out hoarse. There you are. Relief washed through him. What happened? Where's Sally? Elizabeth slowly pushed herself up, 
leaning against the wall for support. I, I don't know Evelyn's drug me when I woke up. She was just gone. Booker clenched his jaw. Whatever Atlas wanted with that girl, they were running out of time to find her. Any idea where he could have taken her? Rubbing her temples, Elizabeth tried to piece together fractured memories. There's a hidden room, somewhere down here. I remember stumbling inside once when I was working with Atlas. She grimaced. We have to find it. Booker helped her to stand. Then that's our next stop, lead the way. They moved through the labyrinth of basements, Booker supporting Elizabeth when her legs wobbled. He could only imagine what Atlas had pumped her full of to keep her compliant. Anger simmered in his gut. Soon Elizabeth stopped short, staring at a nondescript section of brick wall. Here, there has to be a way in. Booker ran his hands along the cold mortar until he found it, a loose block that triggered a mechanism. With a rumble, the wall slid open. Torchlight flickered ahead. Elizabeth tensed. Please, let us find her. Booker gave a solemn nod. We will. Chapter 16 Beyond the hidden doorway lay a sprawling chamber lined with old machinery. Atlas clearly used this as a makeshift base, evidenced by stockpiled guns and crates of smuggled goods. But what drew Booker's eye was the shimmering tear suspended in the air at the room's center. Elizabeth moved toward it as if in a trance. How? Past the tear's distorted surface, Booker could make out familiar Columbia architecture, airships drifting by. Elizabeth's powers were the only explanation. But why had she opened it? Voices echoed from an adjacent room then. Booker quickly pulled Elizabeth behind a large boiler as two of Atlas's men entered. Keep the girl sedated for transport, one said. The bruiser will meet you topside. Transport. Booker's gut twisted. Atlas was moving Sally somewhere else. They needed to act fast. As the thugs moved out of sight, he turned to Elizabeth. I guess Sally, can you close that tear? She nodded firmly, a spark of determination returning to her eyes. Be quick. Booker slipped across the chamber tracking the men's voices. He crept through a doorway and down a hall to an old office where a tiny figure lay bound upon a cot. Sally. In one smooth motion, Booker took down the guards and swept the drowsy girl into his arms. Let's get you home, he whispered. Sally clung to him as he hastened back. By the time he returned, Elizabeth stood alone before the closed tier. Booker stared. What made you open mad before? Elizabeth avoided his gaze, shame creeping into her voice. I thought we could hide there for my mistakes. Hey. Booker waited until she reluctantly met his eyes. The past is done. We make a better future now. After a moment, Elizabeth gave a small nod. Then Sally swarmed for attention, breaking the tension. They so had a chance. Chapter 17 Back at Booker's office, he secured the door while Elizabeth tended to a groggy Sally. The girl had endured a harrowing ordeal, but seemed relatively unharmed. Atlas had yet to inflict the full damage plan. Elizabeth smoothed Sally's hair back gently. I'm so sorry you went through that. Her voice hitched. But I promise you'll never be hurt again. Sally blanked up at her with those trusting eyes that wrenched Elizabeth's heart. We go home now. Home. Elizabeth had been so fixated on rescuing Sally, 
she hadn't thought beyond that. But where was home for two people so adrift? An idea lit in her mind then. How would you like to see the sun again in the sky? At Sally's eager nod, Elizabeth turned to Booker. We could take her to the surface, start a new life. Booker's expression grew wary. What about rapture? What about a... Elizabeth waved a hand bitterly. This place is long past saving, but Sally still has a chance if we leave. So we just abandon all its people, Booker retorted. You really want to bring that kind of violence down here? Elizabeth faltered. She hadn't considered the fallout, only Sally's well-being. Booker's tone softened. I know you want better for her, but escaping fixes nothing in the end. Real change takes grit, here and now, you taught me that. Looking between him and Sally, Elizabeth let his words sink in. He was right. Running was rarely the answer. This city might be deeply scarred, but hadn't she come here believing it could be healed too? Elizabeth knelt and took Sally's hands in hers. How about we stay a little longer and try to help the good people here? Do you think you can do that? After a moment, Sally nodded bravely. Rising, Elizabeth met Booker's approving gaze, new resolve stealing her spine. Their future was still unwritten, and she would face it with courage. Chapter 18 Booker ushered them out of the office and through the grimy streets, vigilant for any sign of Atlas's men. The longer they stayed in rapture, the more danger closing it around them. But Elizabeth was adamant about not giving up yet. Back at her apartment in Mercury Suites, she sat Sally down with paper and crayons. Why'd she make a nice picture for Mr. DeWitt while I talked to him? Sally happily agreed, spreading her supplies out. Elizabeth led Booker into the small kitchen and folded her arms. I know you don't approve of my plans for Sally. Booker sighed, scratching his chin. Look, I get one better for her, but you really think bringing down the whole city is the way? If that's what it takes to protect her, yes, Elizabeth said fiercely. I won't lose her again. Even if it means everyone else suffers. Booker shot back. You can't play God like that. Elizabeth bristled. You don't understand. You didn't hold her lifeless body in your arms, knowing you failed her. No, I've just had to kill a man wearing my face to save a girl once. Booker met her glare steadily. Sometimes you have to let go of the dead to save the living. His words struck deep, resonating with memories etched into her very bones. Elizabeth turned away, struggling to steady her breathing. Maybe she didn't have the right to sacrifice Rapture for Sally. But how could she walk away when the girl had no one else? From the next room, Sally's giggles carried as she played. Elizabeth closed her eyes, grasping for the right path in a universe where nothing was truly black and white. Booker gently touched her shoulder. How about we take it one day at a time, see where it leads? Looking up at him, Elizabeth managed a small nod. For now, it was enough. Chapter 19 They settled into an uneasy waiting game after that. Booker pulled what strings he could to keep Atlas off their trail, while Elizabeth cared for Sally. But the girl grew more withdrawn by the day, the spark fading from her eyes. She'd been through much for one so young, then one night, Elizabeth awoke two sobs coming from Sally's room. She rushed in to find the bed empty, sheets tossed aside. Sally was gone. No, no. Heart in her throat, Elizabeth flew through the rooms, checking every corner. No sign of the girl. She turned to Booker with rising panic. 
She ran off. You have to help me find her. Booker quickly donned his coat and hat. Stay here in case she comes back. I'll search the area. Nodding numbly, Elizabeth sank down on the couch to wait as he hurried out. How long had Sally been planning this escape? Had Elizabeth's smothering attention become stifling? Guilt threatened to swallow her until she forced it back. Sally needed her focus right now. The hours passed at an agonizing crawl. When Booker finally returned empty-handed, Elizabeth was nearly crawling out of her skin with worry. His expression was grim. Trail went cold at Fontaine's, places like a damn maze. He hesitated. We'll keep looking, but... Elizabeth's throat constricted around all the promises she longed to cry out, that she would find Sally, keep her safe here. But the words dried up, giving way to sobs. Sally was lost, and she had only herself to blame. Booker's strong arms wrapped around her as she broke down. They stayed that way through the long night, hope fraying to a mere thread. Wherever Sally was, they had to believe she would hold on until dawn. Chapter 20 Morning light found them back at Fontaine's, picking through every inch of the dilapidated department store. Behind dusty cabinets, squeezed into ventilation shafts, they left no corner unsearched in pursuit of Sally. After hours of fruitless effort, Elizabeth sagged against the wall, fighting tears. Each minute that passed made the odds of finding Sally unharmed slimmer. She couldn't stomach the thought of Atlas getting his claws on the girl again. Booker paused his inspection of empty display cases. She has to be hiding here somewhere. We'll check the sub-basements next, rephrase every step. His jaw took on a determined set. I'm not leaving her to that monster. Elizabeth managed a wavering knot. Sally was a resilient little thing when she wanted to be. And easy to overlook when scared. Their only hope was flushing her out, showing she had nothing left to fear. They descended the rickety stairs down into the bowels of the building. As they scoured the dusty rooms, Elizabeth called Sally's name softly, promising safety and comfort if she just came out. No response yet, but she had to be nearby. Elizabeth could almost sense it. That's when she heard the faint scuff of a small shoe on concrete. Whirling, she spotted a tiny shadow dart across the hall and through a doorway. This way. Elizabeth took off running, Booker close behind her. They followed the signs of passage, drag marks and dust, a tiny handprint smeared on a pipe, leading them into the boiler room depths. Sally had come this way. The chase was on now. Chapter 21 Elizabeth could hear the patter of Sally's footsteps ahead as she wove through the maze of tunnels with Booker. They were gaining on her at last. But just when Elizabeth thought they had her cornered in the boiler room, Sally scrambled up into the ventilation system. No, wait. Elizabeth cried, but the girl had already disappeared inside. Booker was already shoving a crate under the open vent. I'll go after her, wait topside in case she circles back. Before Elizabeth could argue, he hoisted himself up into the tight metal shaft. Reluctantly, she returned to the main floor, pacing as the minutes stretched by. What was taking so long? Just when Elizabeth resolved to head back down, a blood-curdling scream shattered the silence. No. Elizabeth flew through the basements, her pulse roaring. Bursting into the boiler room, she found Booker crumpled at the foot of the vent, a dark stain spreading across his shirt. Booker! She fell to her knees beside him, frantically pressing on the bullet wound, but his eyes had already taken on a distant glaze. Well, isn't this poetic? 
Atlas emerged from the shadows, pistol in hand. Ain't nothing to do now but wait for the circle to close. Elizabeth scarcely heard him, clutching Booker tighter as his body cooled. Sally Booker, everyone she tried to protect ultimately suffered. Perhaps she was simply cursed to destroy all she touched. Come on now, enough moping. Atlas hauled her roughly to her feet. We got work to finish. Elizabeth didn't resist as he shoved her along. What was left to fight for anymore? She had thought to outrun fate, only to wind up right back where she started. In the end, some destinies could never be changed. Chapter 22 Days blurred into weeks under Atlas's ruthless hole. Elizabeth endured his experiments blankly, too hollowed out now to resist. This was merely the inevitability of her fate, catching up at last. She thought of Booker often, regret piercing through the haze. He had believed in creating a better future. But that noble dream died with him in the depths. Elizabeth wasn't sure how much time passed before Atlas barged into the locked medical room she was confined to. His eyes held that wild, zealous light that signified violent plans brewing. It's time, kid, we're tacking Ryan out tonight. He tossed her a heavy sweater and jeans. You're with me when I send the old geezer to his grave. Elizabeth wordlessly shed the thin medical gown and dressed. What did Ryan's demise matter now? She was too far gone to be saved, but perhaps she could still grant the true innocence here a chance to survive before rapture collapsed. Atlas marched her through Point Prometheus at gunpoint. They took a bathysphere down to rapture central control, Atlas muttering about revolution and comeuppance. Elizabeth drifted through it numbly. Only when the door slid open to reveal Ryan's office did some flicker of emotion pierce her stupor. Well, if it isn't the prodigal daughter. Ryan sat at his desk, regarding her calmly. Have you come to slay your father again? Elizabeth shook her head dully. That pitiful obsession had already destroyed her once and launched her on this tragic trajectory. Never again. When Atlas shot her a glare, she silently moved forward and wrapped her hands around Ryan's neck. As his protests girdled out, she met his bulging eyes. This cycle ends here. With one decisive snap, Elizabeth ended Ryan's tyranny and the ideology poisoning her soul. Then she turned to face her own fate. The End <laughs>